we're going to do in this uh, third part is, um, if you look at the description of the day, uh, focusing on the problems and possibilities connected with John's passion narrative, that will be the focus of this third part. And what I'd like to walk us through, obviously we're not going to be able to go through verse by verse uh, John's passion narrative, but I would like to set forth for you um, some not only distinct features of John's telling of uh, the putting to death of Jesus, uh, but also to uh, highlight what I think are some important and helpful theological reflections. Uh, now this passage is, and, the, and John's telling of this is not without his problems, and Dan is going to address that, particularly with uh, this issue of who are the Jews um, who are um, spoken of uh, so negatively. So John's version of the Passion is what is proclaimed on Good Friday. As you know, it's on, on, on Palm Sunday, we read both the entrance into Jerusalem and the Passion from the Synoptic Gospel of the, of the year in question, in this year, uh, Mark's Gospel. But on Good Friday, right in the midst of the church's holy triduum, the most holy three days of the year, we hear John's version of this. And in some respects, uh, the term passion isn't fully apt for John because throughout his telling of Jesus' death, uh, John emphasizes that Jesus goes to his death willingly and that he's in complete control of all the events that transpire. And just to give a flavor of this, kind of the classic example of this Johannine characteristic is John's portrayal of Jesus in the garden. I've already uh, mentioned that John doesn't have the agony in the garden. We saw the agony in uh, chapter 12, verse 27. That was the extent of it. Uh, John does have Jesus in the garden praying with his, his uh, disciples. And then uh, the uh, contingent of soldiers come out and the guards come out to arrest the unarmed Jesus. And Jesus comes out of uh, what appears to be he's in, a, in an enclave with his followers. And Jesus comes out and says, uh, whom are you looking for? And they say, Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am, ego emi, uh, that name of the divine from Exodus 3, from uh, parts of uh, Second Isaiah. And when Jesus, and, and just picture the scene, you have this armed contingent coming out to, to apprehend the unarmed Jesus, and Jesus says, I am, and in response to that, the soldiers, the guards all fall back. Those with arms fall back to the ground uh, helpless. Okay. This detail is, in effect, a theophany, a manifestation of the divine. This is how one uh, responds in the face, in the presence of the divine one. Um, and it sets the entire uh, telling of the Passion in John's Gospel in that context. There's also a detail here where Jesus says, I am again, they come to arrest him, and Jesus says, let these men who are with me uh, go away unharmed. And that's not an accidental detail in John's Gospel because here we see Jesus fulfilling his role as the Good Shepherd who does not allow any of his sheep to be snatched away. Okay, so there's another example of how this gospel keeps going back and forth. Now the centerpiece of uh, John's account of Jesus' passion is the trial before Pilate. So John follows the script of the Synoptic Gospels. After Jesus' arrest, he appears uh, before uh, the high Jewish high priest. You have the denials of Peter. Um, John includes those two, but the centerpiece for John is the trial before Pilate. Uh, John gives 39 verses to this scene, or to this 
uh, part of the story. Compare that with Mark's gospel that has 15 verses, so just to give you a flavor of the difference. And this is a very highly choreographed scene. And, and basically, Pilate is presented as going back and forth between being inside the praetorium, his palace, with Jesus, who's been arrested, and then going outside in the courtyard, uh, encountering the Jewish leaders. And in effect, there's seven mini scenes in this uh, part of the story. And the middle one is the one that is most important, at least for John. It's a great example of Johannine irony. So we see that Pilate, who from one perspective is the judge, he's the governor, the procurator, the one who represents the power of Rome. Um, so Pilate is judge and ruler, a representative of the ruler. But what we really find in this passage is that the true judge is Jesus. And the true Messiah, the true king, is also Jesus. And one of the ways that John uh, adapts this story for a particular theological purpose is it would seem that when people were uh, sentenced to this terrible death of crucifixion that Dan described earlier. Uh, the first enactment of that sentence then would be to have that person scourged. Okay? John has this scene happen before Jesus has been condemned to death. And from one vantage point, you might read it as if Pilate's saying, well, we'll punish him a little bit and then maybe that will placate. But what this moving the scourging before the condemnation of Jesus does is it allows Jesus, that, that image of Jesus to be dressed in the purple cloak, the, royal, the color of royalty, crowned with thorns. The very middle of this passage is when Pilate comes out with Jesus wearing the crown of thorns, wearing the purple cloak, and says, ecce homo, edu ha anthropos, behold the man. Uh, and in saying that, Pilate bears unwittingly uh, more information, more witness than he's aware of. Because Jesus is the Messiah, is the king, as the son of man, who must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him might have life. Okay. Um, you also have this interchange in which Pilate is shown asking, well, what is truth? Jesus is the one who's come to reveal uh, the truth because he's come to reveal God and God's love. Jesus is the true eschatological judge. And there's a little detail if you look in chapter 19, verse 13. And in, depending on your translation, this will be read differently. The Greek is ambiguous. If you have the New American Bible, it will say, Pilate sat Jesus on the bema, on the judgment seat. Uh, other translations will say that Pilate sat himself on the judgment seat. I think the first reading is actually the better reading. It captures the irony that Jesus is the one who's really the judge and the ruler. Uh, another unique feature here is um, Jesus carrying the cross. When we think of Jesus carrying the cross, we often think of another figure, right? Simon of Cyrene. Well, if we didn't have Matthew, Mark, or Luke, we would not know of Simon of Cyrene because in John's gospel, Jesus carries the cross himself. And the, the idea here is to focus, uh, keep the focus on Jesus and what it is he's revealing. Something similar goes on in the feeding of the 5,000 men, so let's say maybe 10 or 12,000 people uh, in chapter 6 of John's gospel. When you think, when you uh, hear that story, Jesus multiplies the loaves, right? Who gives, who, who are the distributors of the largess of Jesus? We, it's the disciples, right? Not in John's gospel. As impressive as the miracle of multiplying loaves is in John's gospel, Jesus is the one who distributes all of, you know, to the thousands. Again, the, the, the point is uh, Christological to keep uh, the focus on on Jesus and his self-offering in love. The telling of the crucifixion itself is done with great decorum and with uh, great economy. Uh, 
In John's Gospel, there's no reference to the mockery uh, of Jesus. There's no solar eclipse. There's no earthquake. There's no tearing of the temple curtain. There's, in effect, there's no pyrotechnics <laughs> in John's Gospel. We'll see that Jesus maintains his dignity and his self-control throughout. And that's best evidenced by reflecting on the last words of Jesus in John's Gospel. Uh, I think many of us are familiar with the devotion of the seven last words of Jesus. If you combine all the Gospel accounts, there's seven different things that Jesus says from the cross. Three of them are uh, from John's Gospel, and they're all unique to John. First, Jesus has at the foot of the cross in John's Gospel, a unique feature, the mother of Jesus and the beloved disciple. And Jesus says to, the mother, uh, to his mother, woman, behold your son, and to the beloved disciple, behold your mother. And in effect, what Jesus is signifying here is that there's a new family, a new family of faith that's being brought together uh, as Jesus' hour is being consummated. I don't think there's any accident that um, these two figures are present. Um, this is only the second time the mother of Jesus appears in the Gospel of John, and she's never called Mary, so always the mother of Jesus. She appears at the beginning, at the wedding feast of Cana, uh, where Jesus performs the first sign, and when uh, the mother asks Jesus to do this, Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. Okay. Um, but, uh, and I can relate to this, not that I have messianic pretensions, but uh, my mother can get me to do anything, and so it seems to be the case with Jesus. And you have this miracle of the water changed to wine, right? Then the beloved disciple, who's also here, where does he first appear? At another pivotal moment at the foot washing, the Last Supper. He's at the uh, bosom of Jesus. He's uh, at the scene where Jesus takes water and washes the disciples' feet as, in effect, a commentary on how the Eucharist is to be lived out, is to be manifested. John doesn't tell the story of Jesus' last words over the bread and cup. He has the bread of life discourse, but it would seem that the Eucharist is presumed at the Last Supper. So it's surely no accident that these two key figures who have witnessed things about water and wine, it's no accident that they witness as Jesus dies the water and the blood flowing out from his side, uh, representing at least at one level the uh, sacramental gifts of baptism in the Eucharist. Jesus' second word then is, I thirst. Okay. Now all the other Gospels have... Uh, Jesus being given something to drink, but only in John's gospel does Jesus take the initiative, in effect, asking for the drink. And in doing so, he reveals himself as fully willing to drink the cup that the Father has given him. He mentions this toward the beginning of the Passion account. I think even more fundamentally, uh, Jesus' food has always been to do the will of his heavenly Father. His final words, it is completed. Uh, another way to translate this would be, it is brought to fulfillment, it is brought even to perfection. Um, to uh, digress to a, a, a grammatical point for a second, this is in a, the perfect tense. And the perfect tense in the Greek signifies something that happened that has ongoing consequences into the present. And when, so when Jesus says it is completed, he's expressing his confidence that he has fulfilled his mission. Okay. These words convey not despair and defeat, but rather victory. Okay. And Jesus' last act then is to incline his head and hand over, your translation might say, uh, thus, uh, thus spirit, or his spirit, uh, the Greek literally says, the spirit. And I would, if I were in charge of the translation that you're reading, I would capitalize that S. Okay. Um, we're going to see Jesus bestowing his spirit again 
when he appears to the, uh, is, is risen when he appears to the uh, disciples behind locked doors. Jesus is the one who lays down his life for his sheep. And as we'll see in the next segment, or my next segment, at the completion of Jesus' hour, which will be his resurrection and exaltation, will also result in the bestowal of the Spirit, the living waters that flow from the heart of the crucified and risen Jesus. Uh, the last thing I say, and Dan actually already mentioned this, so I can just say it very succinctly, that Jesus' death in John's Gospel doesn't occur on the Passover itself, but on the day of preparation, at the hour when the Passover lambs were being sacrificed. So John accentuates the linkage between Jesus and the Passover lamb, not only with that, telling the story in that way, but also with the detail that his legs were not broken okay, uh, by the soldiers who were overseeing the execution. That's a good description of the Passover lamb whose uh, bones were not to be broken. So we see Jesus not only as the good shepherd, but also as John the Baptist pointed out at the outset of the gospel, Jesus is also the lamb of God who takes away the sins of sin of the world. And with that, I'll turn over to Dan. When you read St. John's Passion Narrative, you'll see a lot of references to the Jews. Uh, generally, it's in a negative context. All through St. John's Gospel, you've got references to hoi eudaioi, the Jews or the Judeans. You could translate it that way. In some cases, the phrase is used in a neutral sense or a positive sense. But for the most part, it's used in a negative context. So when we read St. John's Gospel's passion narrative at the Good Friday service, our people and you and I are hearing a lot about the Jews, and it's not a very flattering picture. And it has been charged that this kind of reading, in a sense, is a source of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, both in the past but also in the present. According to the uh, Passion narrative, uh, the Jews were the ones who hand over Jesus to Pontius Pilate. They're the ones who uh, keep pushing him to have Jesus executed. And finally, Pilate hands Jesus over to them thus giving the impression that the Jews were responsible for the actual killing of Jesus, whereas historically that's highly unlikely. The Romans ultimately would be legally responsible for the death of Jesus. So what do we make out of this? Uh, are the Gospels, and in particular this Gospel, anti-Jewish? Remember the great controversy several years ago about Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, and it was often charged that the Gospels themselves were anti-Jewish. How would I respond to that? I would say that the Gospels themselves are not anti-Jewish, and the St. John's Gospel would be one of them. And I would say that the author and the original audience for the Gospel were themselves Jews, uh, they were Jewish Christians. Uh, so to say that the evangelists or uh, their original audience were anti-Jewish, I think is unlikely. However, we have to admit the anti-Jewish potential of words like the Jews, and so we have to confront that and see what we can do with it. For me, uh, it's important to understand the historical context of John's Gospel and the use of that phrase, the Jews. And with respect to the historical context, I'd make three points. The uh, sociological factors, the political factors, and the theological factors. First, the sociological factors. One of the most striking events in the history of the Jewish people was the destruction of the temple in the year 70 by the Romans. 
Uh, up to that point, they had the land, they had the law, and they had the temple. Now, after the year 70, they didn't have the temple anymore because it had been destroyed by the Romans. And they didn't really have the land because the Romans had taken uh, even more control of it than they had before. So all they had basically was the law. And one of the issues is how do we preserve the heritage of Israel? And there are several answers to that. One answer are the uh, political uh, insurgents, the kind of people we find today in the Middle East, people who were rebels, basically. And that movement ended up with a second Jewish revolt in the year 132 to 135. A second approach was the apocalyptic approach. God will uh, eventually intervene and vindicate our people and somehow or other will rebuild the temple. A third approach is the Pharisaic or rabbinic approach. In other words, uh, focus especially on the law as we have it and the traditions surrounding the law. A fourth um, option is the Christian Jewish option the kind of thing we find in St. John and also in St. Matthew and several other uh, New Testament texts. These people would be saying that the fullness of Judaism is not in the temple or the land or the law, rather it's in the person of Jesus. And the best way to carry on the heritage of Israel is the community formed around the person of Jesus. So that's sociological factors. Political factors. After the year 70, Jews had little political power. And in a sense, it's in the self-interest of early Christian writers to uh, de-emphasize Roman guilt and emphasize a lot Jewish guilt. And I think you can find this thing, uh, this um, approach also in St. John's Gospel and in the other Gospels too. Theological factors. St. John has uh, a lot of dualisms, light and darkness, this world and uh, 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 the community of Jesus or the person of Jesus. In John's gospel, the word world is often, as I've said before, a negative uh, uh, word, and the Jews belong to that. Who are the Jews? Basically, uh, they are those who do not accept Jesus as the revealer and the revelation of God. So uh, in this kind of dualistic theological thinking, the uh, portrait at least of the Jews, that is those who do not uh, believe in Jesus as the revealer in the revelation of God is um, painted in a very dark way. So in this historical context, uh, the negative portrayal of the Jews, at least, is understandable, if not uh, anything else. It's certainly understandable. Remember, the issue here is uh, the gospel itself, I would not regard as anti-Jewish, but I would be uh, emphasizing the anti-Jewish potential that it has. Uh, I think uh, almost everybody here has been, will be, or is now a teacher of some sort. And uh, it's important that we try to place the negative use of the term the Jews, particularly in the Passion narrative, in its historical setting. I think that's an important obligation we have as Christian educators. What then can we do uh, besides trying to educate our people or helping them to understand the historical context? I think that's, that's an important thing to do. What about other translations or other ways to translate this? Most of the mainline translations like the New Revised Standard Versions and the New American Bible hold on to the Jews as a translation of hoi yudaioi. 
Uh, some translations uh, substitute some Jews or the Jewish leaders or even use the phrase Judeans. People argue about whether these are accurate to what St. John wanted to say, and that's the problem. And you get into the whole issue of what a translation should be. We ourselves have recently had this uh, rather interesting debate about formal translations uh, and dynamic translations. The dynamic translations being the old liturgy, if you will, and the uh, new liturgy is a mere a more formal, literal kind of English. So that's one of the issues. I, I think then uh, the two things that we have to do is to uh, educate our people to the historical circumstances of John's Gospel, and I think we also have to think about translating this, if not in the printed translations that we have, perhaps in liturgical translations. Let me end this with some quotations from the Second Vatican Council. Belinda started us off this afternoon with a quotation from the Second Vatican Council. I would like to quote from Nostra Aetate, In Our Age. This is a small document, but a very important document, about the relationship of the Catholic Church to other religions. In part four of that, we have a very interesting and very important statement about the relation of the Catholic Church to the Jewish people. And it, it ends uh, by saying some important things, particularly for Christian educators. Neither all Jews indiscriminately at that time, nor Jews today, can be charged with the crimes committed during his passion. The crimes, of course, were committed by some Jewish leaders and by the Roman officials, but surely not by all Jews in the land of Israel and in the diaspora of that time, nor uh, all Jews throughout history. A second point. All, uh, this uh, applies especially to teachers and preachers, all must take care lest in catechizing or in preaching the word of God, they teach anything which is not in accord with the truth of the gospel message or the spirit of Christ. And the third and final point, the church reproves every form of persecution. She deplores all hatreds, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism leveled at any time or from any source against the Jews. These are strong statements, and when Pope John XXIII called the council, one of the things very high on his agenda was that uh, the council should make a statement about the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people. And uh, I think this is a statement, Nostra Aetate, paragraph four, that bears a lot of meditation and reflection. Thank you. If you want to read uh, uh, a book about the relationship between John's gospel and the Jewish people that takes uh, up uh, all of the text from St. John's gospel, but also uh, in the spirit of recent Roman documentation, including Nostra Aetate IV, uh, there is a book at the back of the hall by George Smeager, S-M-I-G-A, S-M-I-G-A, which I would highly recommend. It's from Paulus Press, and George Smiga is uh, a Catholic priest who has a special interest in Christian-Jewish relations. So if you want to pursue further the relationship between uh, the Catholic Church and the Jewish people, according not only to John's Gospel, but also according to Catholic documentation, which is quite extensive. I would highly recommend that book. Thank you. Admittedly, it's a bit awkward to be talking about Easter as we get so close to, uh, to Holy Week, but... Um, I'd like to share with you uh, John's teaching about Easter with particular focus on chapter 20 and what John says about um, 
the appearance is the risen Jesus. Uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, there can be some, some uh, different options, but for the most part, most liturgies on Easter Sunday will proclaim uh, John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. And a surprising feature of that selection is that this uh, gospel reading does not include an appearance of the risen Jesus. Matter of fact, it doesn't even have an announcement of, uh, by the angels yet, the messengers, that he is raised from the dead. Uh, one thing I should say from the outset is that uh, all four gospels share these common characteristics that this, uh, the story of Easter Sunday begins very early as darkness is coming, uh, becoming light. You have at least one woman uh, or women going to the tomb. Um, Mary Magdalene is the linchpin. She's mentioned in all of these. And as a matter of fact, in John's gospel, she's the only person who's going out on early Easter Sunday. And they all then uh, recount that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb, and the tomb was empty. Uh, those are all commonalities, but what's striking about these, the four Gospels, including John's, is they all have a different uh, resurrection or different traditions of Jesus' appearances. So on Easter Sunday, we hear not of the uh, appearance of the risen Jesus, but we have uh, the story of the empty tomb. Uh, so Mary Magdalene goes and she notices that the uh, stone uh, covering the tomb had been removed. Uh, another little grammatical point here. This is, you remember the difference between active voice and passive voice? You know, mom baked the cake or the cake was baked by mom. This is a passive, but a particular kind of passive. It's a divine passive. It's indicating divine activity. The stone has been rolled away. And uh, Mary, who's come not to anoint Jesus, again, this is a different, uh, different detail in John's gospel, uh, the Johannine Jesus receives a very impressive anointing after his death. This is Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, they would have needed a couple of strapping young men to carry all the poundage of uh, ointment that's described. That's John's way of emphasizing Jesus as king, as Messiah. He does receive a, a royal uh, anointing. So Mary doesn't come to anoint Jesus, but she notices that the stone is rolled away, and she runs and tells uh, the apostles. And we have this foot race between Peter and the beloved disciple. And much ink has been spilled as to the significance. Of course, the beloved disciple gets there sooner. The only exegetical conclusion I can come to is that the beloved disciple was a faster runner. Uh, he may have been the guy you'd want to, to be your pinch runner, not Peter, uh, if in need. Um, but they both peer in, and they notice that the tomb is empty, and they also notice that Jesus' burial clothes, his wrappings have been left behind. And in particular, Peter notices that the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was now rolled up. Again, notice the voice, passive voice. Uh, from one vantage point, we could make the conclusion that Jesus was brought up well, that when you get up from sleep, you <laughs> fold your pajamas and put them to the side. But there's a more theological point here. And again, this is one of those connections that can be made. When Lazarus comes forth from the tomb, Lazarus still has his head covering on. As a matter of fact, he's fully bound. Jesus comes out of the tomb. The trappings of death have been left behind. Death no longer has hold over Jesus. Or another way of putting it is Jesus has left the realm of death. Now, Easter Sunday, as we know, is really not a day. 24 hours is not sufficient to celebrate Easter Sunday. Of course, we have a 50-day Easter season, but Easter Day is celebrated for eight days, right? That's the octave of Easter, similar to what we have at Christmas. So it's during the uh, celebration of the octave of Easter that we have the various appearance stories 
of Jesus, the risen Jesus proclaimed, uh, culminating with uh, the second Sunday of Easter. So what we hear in Holy Week is all of the appearance stories from the different Gospels, including from John's Gospel, and then we hear on the second Sunday of Easter every uh, year, A, B, and C, uh, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. I'd just like to share, I'd like to uh, uh, go to the middle passage uh, with Mary Magdalene, because Mary's the one who had informed Peter and the beloved disciple that the tomb was empty. They come. And it's interesting, we're told that the beloved disciple peered in and he believed, and yet they didn't understand what was meant by the resurrection of the dead. It seems to be intention. And the best I can do with that is that the beloved disciple believed that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead, but what he didn't yet understand, and this is something I think Dan will get to uh, in his final presentation, is to fully understand, one must have the spirit, the gift of the paraclete, to understand how this has fulfilled the story of scripture. But what about Mary Magdalene? Well, she is next seen at the tomb itself, and she is presented as weeping. And one of the things that Jesus says at his final farewell discourse is, you will weep, but your weeping will yield to great joy. And that's what's going to happen to Mary in this scene. And she is the one who sees the heavenly messengers seated, one at the foot, one at the head of Je where Jesus was. And they don't announce that Jesus is alive. Uh, that's going to be the risen Jesus will reveal that. They ask her why she's weeping. And she says, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they put him. And then she turns around and sees, although doesn't recognize, the risen Jesus. And uh, he, the same conversation. If you've taken him, please let me know. There's great irony here. Because it's one level, the one whom Jesus, uh, Mary is talking to, the risen Jesus, did take the body. He's the one who laid down his life, but the good shepherd not only lays down his life, but he takes it up again. Um, and how is it that Ma Mary recognizes Jesus? He says her name, Mary. And again, this evokes the good shepherd discourse. Why does Jesus, the good shepherd, say, I know my sheep by name, and they know my voice and follow me. It's the recognition of the voice. And then Mary's understandable reaction, this great joy that has uh, come out of her weeping, is to try to cling to Jesus. Uh, Noli tangere, that's one of the first Latin phrases I, I learned. Don't touch, don't cling. Uh, the text isn't clear as to whether or not she actually grabbed Jesus, but the point seems to be Jesus says, don't cling to me, don't hang on. Uh, I must ascend to my father and your father, to my God uh, and, and your God, that is the message that uh, Mary's to take to the, the apostles. Uh, there's a sense here in which Jesus' hour is being completed. He's raised from the dead. He's on his way to ascend to, into heaven. Um, our liturgical year, as you probably know, is very much based on Luke's gospel, Luke's presentation. It's Luke that has uh, 40 days of appearances and Ascension Thursday. It's Luke that has Pentecost on the 50th day. Okay. Uh, John's gospel is different. John condenses all of this, in effect, into a single uh, reality. But what he's conveying here is, uh, this is hard to try to uh, convey in simple language, um, he's trying to talk about something that's transtemporal, that's beyond space and time within the con uh, confines of a narrative. Okay? So he's, he is giving a sense of development here. And that development continues in the next scene, which is Easter Sunday night. The disciples are behind locked doors. These are the ones who have heard Mary say, we have seen the Lord. Now, if death can't hold Jesus back, certainly locked doors are no problem for the risen Jesus. And he appears to the disciples and bestows shalom, peace. 
which is one of the gifts that was promised by Jesus in the farewell discourse. And then he shows his wounds and his, his side. This is the one who was crucified, now raised from the dead. And Jesus breathes upon them the spirit, the spirit that is unleashed through the death and resurrection. Jesus breathes uh, upon his followers. And the image here very much is similar to Genesis 2, where God forms Adam, earth creature, and then breathes ruach into him and he comes to life, this is new creation. And then Jesus commissions uh, the, the disciples to engage in a ministry, a ministry in particular marked by forgiveness. This is an important text uh, for the church's sacramental practice, uh, a celebration of the sacrament of reconciliation. But I would say based on, uh, we haven't really talked about this. In John's gospel, Jesus, uh, sin is basically rejection of Jesus, rejection of the revelation Jesus comes to give. So to enact the minis this ministry that Jesus is giving is, in the first place, to continue to reveal the love of God in the type of servant love that Jesus commissions in uh, the, the foot washing scene. Now, there's one fly in the ointment. One of the disciples was not there. And here I'm going to get a little personal because this is my patron saint. I'm not named after <laughs> Thomas Aquinas. I'm not named after Thomas More, Thomas Beckett, St. Thomas. And Th Thomas gets a bad rap, doubting Thomas. That's how we know him, right? Thomas wasn't there. Now, if we had more time, we could go into the whole midrash and ask why he wasn't there. Um, very striking. It's a good question, why he wasn't there. And another thing you might think about this Easter season is what was that week like in between when you have 10 who are saying he's alive and Thomas is refusing to believe. They're all behind, you know, in close quarters. That's an interesting dynamic. We won't get into that. But notice that just as the disciples who heard Mary Magdalene say, we have seen the risen Lord, they didn't respond until they saw the risen Lord. It seems that's what Thomas is basically asking for. Jesus showed the others his hand and his side. Thomas's request is to experience what they did. So I might be, I was accused one time of having a high Thomasology. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I might be in, uh, guilty of that here. But what's important is Jesus appears a week later, and this time Thomas is with, him, with them, and Jesus uh, presents to Thomas what he presented to the others and invites Thomas to uh, inspect his wounds. Jesus doesn't come down hard on Thomas. He wants him to believe. And it's Thomas who's given the great privilege of making the most profound confession uh, of faith of anyone in the New Testament, my Lord and my God, which is a nice bookend to the gospel, which begins in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. There's also a sense in which this is the Joe and I understanding of the completion of the hour. That the sense is, is that uh, this risen Jesus is now fully in the presence of God, has been fully exalted, imbuing the glory of God, and that's what Thomas is recognizing. So that no, notion of progression from an empty tomb to Jesus is not going to be with us in the same way as before, to his breathing the spirit, the Pentecost, to his exaltation in, in, in glory with God. And then we're told uh, Jesus' words are to Thomas are, blessed, uh, you, blessed are you, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who don't uh, see and yet believe. That's not a slap on Thomas, I don't think. It's actually a word of comfort to us. Because Thomas and the others had a privileged witness. But we're not disadvantaged because of the witness that they bore in the community. That's what Jesus is saying, that we too are blessed because we believe, even if we haven't seen him. What I'd like to do is to say something about Jesus' farewell discourses. Tom explained that while in the narrative of St. John's Gospel, they come at the Last Supper, and there the departing Jesus is giving instructions about how the movement he began can carry on. 
In the liturgical cycle, we place most of this material in the Easter season, particularly the last few weeks or so. And in a sense, that's an appropriate time to read it too, precisely because the Easter season is about how do we continue the mission of Jesus when he is no longer among us as a human person in the land of Palestine or, uh, or whatever. So uh, the challenge of the Easter season is how do we carry on? Now, we've spoken a lot about Jesus' farewell discourses at the Last Supper. Uh, they begin with the washing of the feet and also the, uh, uh, the uh, betrayals of Jesus in chapter 13. Then we get a series, really, of three or four farewell discourses. Did you ever have uh, a friend or a neighbor who says, well, I've got to go home now, and yet uh, <laughs> won't leave? Uh, that's what happens here. At, uh, at one point, I think at the end of chapter 14, Jesus says, arise, let us go, and keeps on talking for three more chapters. Uh, the reason behind this is that these were uh, perhaps once upon a time separate discourses and they've all been put together. Uh, as we'll see, uh, these um, separate discourses, although uh, 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 even though they were perhaps originally separate and can be separated now, they have some common themes that run through them. And what I'd like to do is to point out eight common themes that run through these farewell discourses in the context of trying to figure out what uh, significance they would have for the Christian community, the church, and for Christian life. Uh, how then do we carry on the mission of Jesus? And as we'll see, there are at least eight ways and perhaps more. The first way, of course, is to accept the saving significance of Jesus' death and resurrection. The foot washing we've seen is an exercise in that. Peter, first of all, has to accept salvation not on his own terms, but rather on God's terms. And that involves the mystery of the cross. And that in turn, uh, that example, if you will, suggests that we try to carry on the ideal of servant leadership. A second theme is, of course, love. Love is the spirit that should prevail in the community of Jesus. The, the speeches themselves begin with referring to the new commandment, that you love one another. Exegetes are often arguing about in what sense is this new. At any rate, that's the way it's presented. The love here is a kind of uh, circle of love, if you will, or a kind of chain of love. The idea is, as the father has loved the son, and the son has loved his own, therefore you should love one another. All through the farewell discourses, you get these chains. As the father has sent me, so I send you. Uh, so love, this kind of chain of love. In um, St. John's writings, God has loved us first. And because God has loved us first, Therefore, we can love one another. And this is the emphasis of um, the farewell discourses. When the departing Jesus speaks about keep my commandments, what does he mean? He doesn't necessarily mean the Ten Commandments. I think he means the two commandments. And the two commandments are faith and love to believe in Jesus as the revealer and the revelation of God, to love God and to love one another. Those are the two primary ways by which we carry on the mission of Jesus and the spirit of Jesus' community. A fourth way is the Holy Spirit or the paraclete. The word paraclete means a consoler, but it can also mean an advocate. The phrase is sometimes used of a lawyer, a kind of defense lawyer, somebody who takes up your case, as it were. 
the paraclete or the Holy Spirit is in a sense the figure who carries on the mission of Jesus among us. There are several phrases to um, another paraclete. Jesus, of course, is the first paraclete, but the Holy Spirit is the second paraclete. The uh, community formed around the person of Jesus then has the Holy Spirit guiding and directing it along the way. In chapters 15 and 16, there are several sayings about what the paraclete does. One of the things the paraclete does is teaches us, teaches us the things that Jesus himself taught us. So we've seen accepting salvation on God's terms. We've seen love, love of God, love for one another. We've seen belief or faith, believing in the person of Jesus and his heavenly father, the Holy Spirit and the paraclete guiding the community of Jesus. Um, a fifth way is the sort of vital relationship captured by the image of the vine and the branches. This comes up in St. John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. The idea is that believers are related to Jesus in an organic way. It's as if his life blood courses through us, that we are then uh, prolongations, if you will, of the life of Jesus. So that vital relationship with the risen Jesus is a fifth point. A sixth point is that we be people of hope. Now, uh, strangely enough, John never uses the word hope, either as a noun or a verb. Uh, he's so much interested in belief or faith and uh, love that he doesn't use that kind of vocabulary. Instead, hope seems to be sort of embedded in faith and love. Nevertheless, there are certainly elements of hope. John, in several places, agrees with the early Christian tradition of the already and not yet. In, in other words, already we are enjoying the benefits of Jesus' death and resurrection, yet the fullness is future, uh, and we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. John is mainly interested in the already, but when we think of what Christian life is according to St. John, there's plenty of reason to be hopeful, not only in the final great hope, but also in the way we relate to one another and the way we relate to the world. A seventh item is the item of mission. In other words, that other chain that I spoke about as the Father uh, has sent me, so I send you. Jesus at the Last Supper urges his disciples to go forth and to carry on his own mission. So there's a sense of mission. And finally, uh, unity within the community. In John chapter 17, we have a passage that sometimes is called the great high priestly prayer. Jesus prays on behalf of his people. He prays first on behalf of himself. He prays then on behalf of his disciples. And then he prays on behalf of those who will become disciples through his disciples. But it's fundamentally the prayer of the Son of God. And what he prays for especially is unity within the community. The unity that he prays for is not simply a kind of voluntary association. We've all come here this afternoon as a voluntary association. The kind of unity John is speaking about, or in fact the whole New Testament is uh, speaking about, is 
unity from above. In other words, we are united in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that makes up the great unity that can and should and sometimes does exist. So these are eight points of uh, ways by which we find in the Farewell Discourse and the Last Supper Discourse, uh, ways by which we can carry on the mission of Jesus. Accepting salvation on its own terms, uh, love, faith, the Holy Spirit, vital relationship with Jesus, people of hope, mission, and unity. So uh, the amazing thing we've done this afternoon is we've kept to our schedule. <laughs> And uh, so we have a, um, a few minutes uh, for discussion, for uh, uh, questions, and so on and so forth. So please feel free to ask anything you want. Told us about, doesn't include the, the, um, the words the poor. I, I'm oh, not hearing. Speak into this. Into this. I'm oh, sorry. The words the poor have not come up at all. P O O R. Oh. We, uh, you know, where are those disciples? No. <laughs> um, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, 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 the. Uh, certainly the uh, kinds of people uh, that you, the characters you find in St. John's Gospel are uh, a kind of slice of society of the time. The man born blind would certainly be regarded as poor. The Samaritan woman with five husbands or whatever would be regarded as poor. So uh, John doesn't talk so much about riches and poverty as, for example, St. Luke does, but I think in the kinds of characters or the paralyzed man in John chapter five, uh, I think these individual characters, uh, sometimes unparalleled in the other gospels, sort of fulfill the same function, Jesus' mission to marginal people. Uh, so it's not simply to the poor, rather it's to marginal people, and there are at least several examples of marginal people in John's Gospel. Please. I know that in the, I know that in the Gospel of John, uh, it is underlined that Jesus has uh, chosen himself to go to the passion, the cross. He was master of his own life. And he said in John 10 that he's the one who is able to give his life and to, bring, and to take it back. So I don't understand when it's said that it, he was handed over, how, how I, I can't reconcile the fact that he was handed over and that the fact that John says that he gave himself his life. He was master of his life until the end. I would uh, at least uh, approach that from the sort of unity that exists between father and son. In other words, Jesus is being presented as perfectly attuned to the father's will. So uh, they're not, in a sense, separated entities so much as they are in one accord. But Tom Wright. Yeah, well, um, it, it is, it's a good question. I, I think part of the, the tension is uh, we put uh, will and causality against one another. So uh, you know, from a human van or from a vantage point, let's say, of somebody looking at this story from without knowing what Judas does, Jesus is handed over. And yet Jesus himself is uh, in being faithful to what God has called him to do doesn't flee from this. Uh, but there's also a sense in which divine causality and human causality uh, are not always in competition with one another either. I mean, you have this um, uh, paradox in, 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 in the Old Testament, Pharaoh hardened his heart, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Who, 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 who's doing it? Well, both and. 
So, I mean, it's, it's a complex question, but um, I, I don't think it's a contradiction. And just for the microphone, we have somebody with a question way up front here in the corner. Yeah. Um, my question is directed to Father Dan. Oh, um, my question is directed to Father Dan. How would you explain pilots coming out and washing of their hands and saying, I declare this man innocent? It seems that as a Roman official, indeed, he did have Christ killed, but he did so reluctantly and at the bidding of the crowd and the Jewish leaders. So there would seem to be some responsibility from that end, not only on the part of Pilate. I'm sorry, I didn't get, I didn't get all of that. Uh, okay. Um, I think from uh, a legal historical perspective, Pilate is ultimately the one who was responsible for the death of Jesus. Uh, and certainly he was encouraged by some Jewish leaders. Uh, the depiction of Pilate in the Gospels presents him as somewhat weak and vacillating. Now, there are some uh, ancient accounts about him, one in Philo and the other Josephus, that uh, sort of go in the opposite direction. But if you read Josephus carefully, you find that in many instances, Pilate sort of gives in to the crowd. And from that perspective, the uh, picture that you get in all the Gospels uh, seems to fit okay. And in, again, when all is said and done, Pilate bears the ultimate responsibility for Jesus' death. Is the, uh, is the divine passive proper to John? And are there other examples? No, there, there's, there's uh, a number of examples. For instance, in, if you look at Mark's gospel in chapter 16, which is the resurrection, uh, well, actually, when Jesus uh, dies, the, the, the curtain was torn in two, and that seems to echo the beginning of the gospel. When the skies open up, the skies are ripped open, and the, the Spirit of God descends, and um, the voice calls out to Jesus, you are my beloved son. So, no, it's something that one sees. And, and, and the reason for the divine passive is uh, the respect for the divine name. So it's a way of communicating God without saying God, so it's not unique to the teacher. Hello. Oh, sorry, that's loud. Um, <clears throat> as so someone who uh, teaches this in a high school setting, um, we use uh, the New American translation with regarding the, the Jews, the use of the term the Jews. Um, do you feel, well, uh, we use textbooks that explain the passage that you said from the Vatican II document about how we should view and teach about uh, the Jews so as not to increase anti-Semitism. Um, and sometimes I also not only use the New American Translation, but also the, uh, the filmed version, which alters the translation of that term, the Jews, from time to time to the Jewish authorities. Um, is that, do you think that's confusing to, to use for people, or should we just keep it purely the Jews and just talk about it in, in a classroom setting? In my submission, there's no perfect answer to this. I, I, I must say what I do, I'll, t I'll tell you what I do, is I do focus. For, for instance, when I preach to uh, the children on Sunday Mass, uh, this will come up again and emphasize that these are the, the, a group of leaders. Um, and I do that even in my teaching uh, here. So, but it's not without its problem. Uh, but I think, for me, that's, that's uh, both pedagogically and also, I, I think, uh, theologically and historically the most responsible. But it, it's not perfect. It's, it's not a perfect solution. Okay. There's, um, there's a new English uh, translation I would call the Common English Bible. It's sponsored ultimately by the mainline Protestant churches but they've invited Catholics like me and, and other people to be part of it to make it ecumenical. It's a rather good translation. Uh, I notice that 
they use the Jewish leaders instead of uh, the Jews for who are you die Now that's a translation that basically is interested in communicating to people. They want it, it to be not so much a study Bible as a kind of thing that one could use in a religious service or, or whatever. And um, I, I think there, there are a number of different translations floating around and a lot depends on what you're gonna use them for. Uh, and so I wonder in a study Bible, you might want to keep the Jews just to be a, uh, a literal translation, but in a, uh, a kind of text that's going to be used in liturgical services, perhaps you need to be more, frankly, historically accurate. Now, there's a sort of tension between historical uh, accuracy and Johannine theology, and that's the problem. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, going back to a couple of questions, but I, I think uh, I have preached on Good Friday for many years now, and I am very happy to say I almost glory in the fact that I have never, ever said God the Father wanted Jesus, his son, dead. I don't think that if you are a Christian or a human being with some kind of honest idea about can, can you say that? It doesn't make any sense, okay? If someone is saying, okay, uh, Jesus, you are going to die for these poor bastards, but don't worry because, you know, a day and a half later you're going to be back much better than before and so forth. I mean, it doesn't make, now, what I think that what my question to you is, in the Gospel of John, when I read about this language of death or, or Jesus willingly accept going into his passion, what I see there is um, is John telling his friends in the church, his brothers and sisters, Jesus was arrested by the Roman Empire and the Jews, whatever it is, okay? People who didn't like him, who, who wanted him dead, okay? And, and when that happens, you know, when, when, when a couple of big guys like the Roman soldiers arrest you, there is nothing that you can do. I mean, that's it. it is, huh? It's like the police here or, or the U.S. Or, or SEALs or Navy SEALs, whatever. But, but if you are a Christian, the point is that if you want to be united with Christ, it's not that you want to die, okay? Or to have, oh, God wants to be dead. The point is that only willingly can you be a disciple of Christ. It, nobody, nobody can force you to be a disciple. You have to really think about that and say, I'm going to be like the grain of wheat who dies and so on. So somehow it gets, it gets mixed in the gospel. And I know that the language of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible and so on, is always the same. But I think that I think it is much better for us Christians and it's common sense and, and probably good exegesis to say, God has nothing to do with God Friday. The word of God, in a sense, the absolute, most radical, most beautiful revelation, to me the only revelation of God is Easter Sunday. You do this, you love death, you design crucifixes, you know, weapons, um, the atomic bomb. I have nothing to do with that. I will rise even you who are so bad from, from the dead. Can you say that? I guess, no. Or? <laughs> it's certainly a good, good Friday sermon anyhow. Is <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Just to, to go back up to about the Jews, um, it seems to me, it's, it says scripturally that salvation comes from the Jews. And of course, Jesus was Jewish. So, right. sure, sure. you know, you have differences among the Jews, but I don't know, it just seems <laughs> easier. Salvation comes from the Jews. Yes, right. The, you know? That's uh, John chapter yeah. four. The, 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 this is what he's, uh, it was what is said in, with respect to the Samaritan woman. Uh, again, uh, there are some uses of the phrase in John's Gospel that are neutral, the customs of the Jews. Some of them are quite positive, as you said, salvation comes from the Jews, and of course all of the uh, first believers are Jews. Uh, however, you get uh, this 
negative use of the same term, uh, uh, whereas in the, the other gospels, for example, in the passion narratives, you get the chief priests and the elders or the scribes, but John, for ill probably rather than for good, uh, chose to use the phrase hoi yudaioi. I think we're getting close to our time, so Melinda might have a few final words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Harrington and Father Stegman. Weren't they a great team working together in this?